one second. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Seberg. I'm the policy coordinator for the uh, Medical Cannabis Research Center at Drexel University. I'm pleased to introduce today our speaker, Dr. Peter Grinspoon. Um, he is a primary care physician and cannabis specialist at Mass General. He's also an instructor at Harvard Medical School and a certified health and wellness coach. Um, Dr. Grinspoon is also a contributing editor to Harvard Health Publications, TEDx speaker, and he also, um, as Abigail mentioned, in the comments, a, uh, the author of the memoir, Free Refills, A Doctor Confronts His Addiction. He's also a board member for the advocacy group, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. And Dr. Gr Grinspoon has previously served as an associate director of the Massachusetts Physician Health Services, helping physicians with addiction and mental health issues. Um, so without further ado, um, Dr. Grinspoon, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. It's great to be here, uh, here being um, in the virtual world um, next year, hopefully in person. Um, let me just try to advance my slides. Great, they're not advancing. There we go. Um, I have a long history with cannabis. Um, I just um, We have a lot of stuff to go over. Today, I was going to talk about what counts as evidence, because that's a pretty fiercely contested issue in the realm of cannabis. Uh, talk a little bit about cannabis and opioids, and talk a little bit about physicians and cannabis. So uh, just very briefly, I've treated patients with medical cannabis my entire career. Um, I've been involved in medical cannabis essentially my whole life. My brother Danny, uh, when he was eight, um, lost his battle against leukemia, but when he was uh, fighting it in the early 1970s, my parents illegally bought him medical cannabis in the early 1970s, right when Richard Nixon was gearing up his war on cannabis. And I saw firsthand how it helped my brother keep food down and uh, sort of endure the ravages of, of chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. So um, while they were teaching us that cannabis is like the evil weed or whatever they taught us with the D.A.R.E. program in school, I was at, in my home um, witnessing that it was a relatively non-toxic and effective medication. Um, also, my father was a very, um, very well-respected cannabis uh, expert. So I, uh, in my living room, there were cannabis scholars and um, social justice advocates um, growing up. That's what I was exposed to. So I've been involved with this issue my whole life. Um, I also have treated a lot of patients, a lot of physicians uh, for opiate addiction and um, 15 years in recovery from opiate addiction myself. So I have a lot of um, experience in the in the field of cannabis and opiates. Um, the education that we get as doctors, as nurses, um, in general about cannabis has been very slanted and not very helpful about cannabis in this country, uh, largely because of the war on drugs. Um, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But the question is, what is evidence? Um, really, the medical establishment uh, has been saying, as respect to cannabis, you know, we don't have much evidence that it works. Um, you know, there aren't randomized controlled uh, trials that say that cannabis is effective for this, that, and the other thing. Uh, things that millions of patients are using it for effectively. So there's a big dichotomy between what patients are finding it to be effective for and what the medical associations, more than the doctors, the medical associations are saying it does, you know, there's no evidence that it works. Um, you know, it's not FDA approved. Um, you know, it's really interesting because we, as a primary care doctor for 25 years, I could tell you that we use medications off label all the time. We use medications for non FDA, FDA Federal Drug Administration, non FDA approved uses. For example, for cannabis use disorder to treat someone who gets addicted to cannabis, um, there's not a single FDA approved drug. Um, we use um, all kinds of medications to treat that. Um, so I, I, it's a little bit of a double standard, I think, for cannabis that we, um, only count a very narrow um, uh, aperture of evidence for cannabis in terms of its benefits. Um, so I just wanted to bring up a little bit the topic of what counts as evidence. For example, um, worldwide, it's not just in the United States, the International Association for the Study of Pain uh, came out very recently in 2021, less than a year ago, um, with a conclusion. They said, due to the lack of high quality clinical evidence, the International Association for the Study of Pain does not currently endorse the general use of cannabis or cannabinoids for pain relief. 
Now, again, I doubt there's anybody in the audience that doesn't know somebody who's using cannabis very successfully for pain relief. So you just have to wonder why this dichotomy? I mean, you could take a very cynical view and say the pain doctors don't want competition from people growing and using their own cannabis. Or you could just say, is it kind of old fart syndrome? They're just like very slow to um, kind of uh, assimilate new information. And this is sort of a relatively new thing, this wave of legalization that's been sweeping around the world. Or is it a question of like what evidence people are looking at? Um, but again, um, it is really amazing that like these pain societies are saying it doesn't work for pain. And there are millions of people that are using it very successfully for pain. I use it all the time in my clinical, in my clinic for pain, people do really well. They get off opiates, they use it instead of opiates. They use it instead of the non-steroidals, which are killing so many people's kidneys as they get older. So it's just a really uh, problematic um, dichotomy among providers. Um, you know, this was a, a piece written in the medical journal STAT, but it was really a much longer piece written in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017 by Tom Frieden, who was, um, the head of, um, was it the CDC or the FDA? I think it was the FDA for eight years under Obama. And he's talking about why the randomized control trial, is, the gold standard, which everybody cites is no longer enough. Um, and this is you know the thing that they're really using to discredit a lot of the indications for medical cannabis. Again, um, in any state where medical cannabis is legalized, it's legalized for pain, for PTSD, for insomnia, for cancer-induced nausea and vomiting, for a whole host of indications. And um, you know there are randomized controlled uh, proof of these indications for like three or four of them. The National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine came out and said, there is proof for insomnia if you have chronic pain, for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, um, and for a couple other indications. But for most of these, there aren't RCTs. So the question is, are RCTs, randomized controlled trials, where you double-blind, placebo-controlled, um, and give one thing and then give a dummy pill um, and see if there's a clinical effect, are these the clinical standard that we should be using? Um, now, according to Dr. Frieden, you know, very established doctor, uh, again, he was Obama's head of the FDA for eight years, uh, randomized controlled trials are critical. They help us know if a lot of drugs work. We have to know if they work versus placebos because the placebo effect is so powerful. But at the same time, they could be expensive to run. They could take years to complete. Uh, they may not last long enough um, to see if an intervention works or to detect a long enough term, um, they might not um, run long enough to detect an um, adverse effect, uh, something that, that might come up after a couple of years. And most importantly, I think the findings from the randomized controlled trials might not be valid uh, beyond the study population. You study, you know, men in their 40s to see if a heart drug works, and then does it apply to women in their 50s? Um, so they are critically important, but I don't think they should be the only evidence that we accept in medicine. And again, I, I do want to point out that tons of stuff that we do in medicine isn't dictated by randomized controlled trials, but it is sort of this club that they use to beat down um, proponents of medical cannabis whenever they um, suggest that um, there are different indications for medical cannabis, which they're seeing from successfully treating their patients. Um, there's been a movement recently for um, incorporating more real world evidence into medical cannabis research. Now, we've used real world evidence since the beginning of medicine. Um, this is what we had before there was um, sort of randomized controlled trials. This is the patient gets better if you do a treatment. Um, and this paper, I'm happy to share my slides with anybody who's interested, really just specifies what are the strengths and the weaknesses of real world evidence. Real world evidence is defined as evidence derived from health data sourced from non-interventional studies, registries, electronic health records, and insurance data. So this is like your observational studies, your retrospective studies. We use a lot of this They're, um, in medicine. They're just not considered as gold standard as the randomized controlled trials because you can introduce bias and confounding variables. So 
real world evidence is basically studies that are not randomized controlled trials. So you look at a study, um, for example, they do a ton of really great uh, medical cannabis research in Israel where the government isn't hysterically against cannabis like it's been in this country for 50 years. And there's a study here, for example, uh, comment trying to show whether or not, trying to find out whether or not medical cannabis is safe and effective in the elderly. And that was actually a really good study because in this country around the world, uh, the use of medical cannabis is skyrocketing in the elderly. Um, we're able to get uh, the elderly off a lot of other medications. Polypharmacy is a huge problem in the elderly. They're on 15 different medications that interact with each other. And with cannabis, we can get them off a lot of these medications. That's another talk that I give. But this study um, looked at thousands of patients um, who either had pain or had cancer. And they um, noted that after six months of treatment with cannabis, 93% of them, 93.7, reported an improvement in their condition. The pain went from an average of eight out of 10 to an average of four out of 10. And 18.1% um, of them um, either decreased or eliminated their use of opiates. There was also a decrease in the use of benzodiazepines. That's a win across the board. Um, the, uh, the side effects were very mild. They were like dizziness and dry mouth. Um, question is, isn't this evidence? Um, and then how could the Chronic Pain Society say that, you know, this came out three years earlier? How is this not considered evidence? This was like great study. Um, all across Europe, they um, are, are basing clinical algorithms on studies like this. So it's just really interesting. There's just a split in the medical community. Another example, I'm really sorry this is hard to see, um, but Stacy Gruber is a fantastic researcher at my home institution, Harvard Medical School. She's at McLean Hospital. She uh, just does spectacular research on cannabis. And they took patients that... Um, that at zero, three months, and six months that were cannabis naive and gave them medical cannabis. And they took other patients that they didn't give medical cannabis to. And they saw that the pain was greatly lessened uh, in the patients who had medical cannabis. Uh, their mood was increased by CBD exposure and their pain was lessened by THC exposure. There was also improvements in sleep, mood, anxiety. And most importantly, you see this a lot, in quality of life. That is a marker that often goes up in these medical cannabis studies. Now that's really hard to study with a randomized controlled trial. And if I could just digress for a minute. Well, the point is, th isn't this evidence? This is a incredibly respected researcher. It's just not a randomized controlled study. I mean, when you think about it, cannabis doesn't really fit into the rubric of randomized controlled study. It's very hard to blind um, a study to cannabis. Most people know if they're high or not, if they've been given cannabis. That's why people have been using cannabis for 5,000 years. That's why people use it recreationally because it makes them high. It has a psychoactive effect. So most people can tell if they've been given the cannabis or the placebo. So it's actually very hard to do blinded placebo controlled studies on cannabis. So the RCTs are very difficult to do on cannabis anyways. But another problem with RCTs, randomized controlled trials, is that you study one variable at a time. And the endocannabinoid system, the system of neurotransmitters and molecules in our bodies that um, by which cannabis works its effect is so complicated and affects so many different other neurotransmitter systems. It's like the air traffic controller for all of our other neurotransmitter systems. Cannabis does like five different things at once. The reason it works so well for a disease like fibromyalgia is that it helps people with pain, anxiety, sleep, the perception of pain. Um, and the randomized control trials study one little um, variable at a time and cannabis does like five different things at once. So it's very difficult to capture the benefit of cannabis in the randomized control trial. So I'm just trying to point out that it is very difficult to capture the benefits of cannabis in this one particular thing, which a lot of people in medicine say, oh, well, this is the only way we can measure benefits. So that's why these pain societies and other medical societies say, the psychiatrists as well say, there's no evidence that cannabis is useful for any psychiatric disorder. And again, millions of people use it for anxiety. It's, 
beyond belief that um, there's such a disagreement about this. But again, I've had such success treating people for anxiety. Um, I, I don't think anybody in the audience knows anybody that doesn't use cannabis for anxiety, but the psychiatrist will hold, or a lot of the psychiatrists, if there's no evidence whatsoever that cannabis works for anxiety, and it's because they're sticking to this narrow definition of evidence. I know this picture looks like um, this guy's really trying hard not to give COVID to the cannabis plant, but in reality, what this study is about is just about the history of evidence in this country, and the fact is because of the war on drugs, we spent so much more um, money, time, and effort looking for harm than looking for benefit. Um, in the last 20 years, we spent about 20 times more money looking for the harms of cannabis because finding benefits of cannabis wasn't a particularly helpful narrative to the war on drugs. Virtually all of the funding went to looking for harms. And that's another reason why there isn't a huge number of studies on the benefits. So there's been a finger on the scale trying to find harms, not benefits. And that's another reason why there isn't as much data as there should be. This is just a point I like to make is that the level of evidence we might wanna factor in how dangerous the treatment is, the diseases that we're treating. If I have a patient and they have a migraine, I'm happy to try to treat them with medical cannabis because if it doesn't work, the worst thing that happens is they get a migraine. Then they think, ah, oh, Dr. Grinspoon didn't treat my migraine. And then they come back and we try something else. It's not the end of the world. Now, if it's something like cancer, we need really good evidence that something like cannabis would work because if they try to treat their cancer with cannabis as opposed to something that is proven to work like chemotherapy, they could harm themselves. So my suggestion is that the level of evidence required, the rigor of the evidence required should be related to sort of the dangerousness of the condition. If you're just treating a symptom like low back pain, sure, try medical cannabis. But if something like disease modifying, like we're trying to treat your cancer, then there actually does have to be really, really rigorous data. Like for example, the randomized controlled trials because you could harm someone if you're not spot on with the research. So I think there should be a escalating ladder of rigor of evidence depending on how dangerous it is to, to, um, to miss um, to misguidedly treat something that doesn't work. So anyways, can, that was evidence in uh, 15 minutes. Cannabis and opiates. Um, there are five ways in which cannabis can help the opiate uh, epidemic. Um, I'm gonna, for sake of time, um, you know, we doctors prescribe too many opiates. Um, you can't just cut people off opiates. Our government thinks that the solution to the opiate crisis is just to put pressure on doctors not to prescribe opiates. That's just actually driving the overdoses up because patients are getting them illegally and overdosing on fentanyl. That's really inhumane. So we're not talking about like yanking opiates away from anybody. That's just the wrong solution. But what you can do is, um, I mean, what I have in my slides here, just in case anybody's interested is, why are cannabis, can, cannabinoids soaring in pop, popularity? Um, you know, they're safe, they've been used for a long time. We know the harms, I went over briefly the harms. Teens shouldn't use cannabis. Don't drive after you get high. Don't use it if you're pregnant, breastfeeding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing I did wanna mention about medical cannabis, again, is Stacy Gruber's work, which is really interesting. She's the doctor that I mentioned earlier at Harvard. She did a lot of work on recreational cannabis users and found that their cognitive uh, function in the short term went down. You know, they were less able to answer questionnaires and, and do cognitive tests. But then she studied medical cannabis patients and something really interesting happened. Their cognitive function improved, uh, which really sort of surprised her and um, blew her away. And um, the medical marijuana patients demonstrated improved task performance accompanied by brain activation patterns that appeared more similar to those exhibited by healthy controls from previous studies at pre-treatment, suggestive of a potential nor normal normalization of brain function relative um, to baseline. Um, these findings suggest that medical marijuana use may result in different effects on the brain relative to recreational uh, marijuana use. Um, she also noted that opiates and benzodiazepines 
went down drastically in three months of treatment. And, you know, it was just really interesting. Why would the effect on cognitive function be different on medical marijuana users than on recreational marijuana users? Is it because they're using legal marijuana that's been, you know, no lead, heavy metal, fungus, no pesticides? Is it because they're using lower doses? Is it because older people are using it, adults and not teenagers? Is it because there's more CBD and less THC? It's just very interesting study, but I'd very, this, um, let me go back for a second. The grass might be greener is one of the most interesting studies I've ever read and I'd highly recommend it to anybody who's interested in this field, in this area. But anyways, the five ways in which cannabinoids can supplant opiates. Number one, you have a new patient with chronic pain. You give them opiates instead of cannabis. That's sort of a no-brainer. They're about equally effective for chronic pain. Like quality of life is better uh, with cannabis and they're about equally effective. For like severe acute pain, you break your arm, you're gonna need opiates. Post-surgical, you're gonna need opiates. But for that chronic pain, Americans are getting portlier, their knees hurt, their back hurts. You can give them cannabis instead of opiates and they tend to do really well. There's no reason to be doling out the oxycodone. And I just have a couple studies um, about how medical cannabis laws have lowered opiate prescribing that are very interesting. Um, and about how when they legalized medical cannabis in Colorado, all the prescriptions went down, which was really interesting. It just shows that people were self-medicating with cannabis across the board. Again, I'm gonna make these slides available. If we had two hours, I'd go over each of these interesting studies one by one. The second way is you could take people who are on chronic opiate th therapy and transition them to medical cannabis. You do a gentle taper off the opiates as you slowly work up the medical cannabinoids. The key to this is you have to do it voluntarily. We're not forcing anybody off opiates. That is unfair. They've been forcing people off opiates and there have been suicides and so forth. So I offer this to patients, but I don't force anybody off opiates, but I do point out that your quality of life is going to be a lot better if you get off the opiates and onto the cannabis. Um, uh, the third way, um, I do want to point out the three states that have legalized medical cannabis have programs where you can go in with your opiate prescription and get a medical cannabis prescription. One of the states is Illinois. I can't remember the other two states, but it's built in to the state level legalization where you can do this, which is pretty cool. The third way is that um, most of the most of the harm from opiates is dose related. You know the overdoses, the constipation, the falls, and it, they work on the same receptors. They co-work the cannabinoids and the opiates. They overlap on the receptors. So you, it's like a one plus one equals three phenomenon with the opiates and the cannabinoids. If you use a small dose of cannabis, it doesn't help with the pain. And if you use a small dose of the opiates, it doesn't help with the pain. But if you use a small dose of both in the lab, it does help with the pain because they work synergistically. So you can achieve up to an 80% dose reduction on the opiates if you use a small amount of cannabis. And this is a huge win for harm reduction. And patients are really open to this because they get rid of a lot of the side effects of the opiates. So you can get, you can lower the dose in the opiates using cannabis. Um, the fourth way is uh, for cannabis, uh, for opiate withdrawal. Uh, that is opiate withdrawal is a nightmare if you're trying to get off opiates. I have personal experience in this and I can tell you that it's, cannabis works way better than any other drug um, if you're trying to get off opiates. And um, with 100,000 plus deaths from opiate overdose in the last calendar year, um, we need to do better with this opiate um, overdose epidemic. And, you know, they give you clonidine, lofexidine, these medications that just relax you a little bit. A cannabis does like five different things at once that really help you come off the opiates. And I just think it's crazy that we're not using cannabis as a first line treatment from my medical experience and my personal experience. Um, patients don't do worse, as you could see from this study. Um, in most studies, cannabis did not significantly, significantly predict treatment outcomes, uh, opiate use, adherence, retention um, in methadone or suboxone programs. Um, and um, in this one study in Vancouver, there was a 21% greater odds of retention 
in, um, in the Suboxone program for people that were daily cannabis users. We were joking in my hospital, let's you know, start passing around the blunts. But anyways, um, and then um, this study is a naturalistic study, real world evidence. Um, you know, good luck getting funding from the government to do a randomized controlled study for this. But um, cannabis um, alleviates self-reported opiate withdrawal symptoms. They did a really good study. And this was in the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment. This isn't some fly-by-night um, journal. Now, the fifth way that's a little bit controversial is whether you could use cannabis like you use Suboxone or Methadone as a medication for opiate use disorder. I don't, even though there's tons of anecdotal evidence. I've heard from like thousands of people that said, yeah, I use cannabis to get off heroin. But the fact is with methadone and with Suboxone, there's evidence that there's a 50 to 80% reduction in overdose and death. And we just don't have that evidence for cannabis. So this fifth way, which we hypothetically could use it in the opioid, opioid crisis, I don't use it because I'm like, why wouldn't we just use the medications that we have evidence for? I'd feel awful if something bad happened if someone overdosed if I were trying to use cannabis. And this is an example of what I said in the first part of my speech. The level of evidence should be related to how potentially bad the outcome is. This is not a migraine that someone's going to get. This is an overdose and potentially death. We don't have evidence that cannabis works. We shouldn't be using cannabis to treat as a medication for opiate use disorder. We should use methadone and suboxone, which is where the evidence lies. If in the future they prove with good studies that cannabis can get people off opiates, uh, heroin, as well as methadone and suboxone, I'd be happy to use it. Um, but right now, I don't think we're there yet. Um, you know, and then that leads to the question, is the cannabis industry making irresponsible claims um, by suggesting that they can get people off opiates? But that's for another day. Um, and then finally, let me see, do we have time to get into, we could talk for doctors and cannabis for a few minutes. <sighs> Most doctors are in favor, 94% of Americans support legal access to medical cannabis. I mean, you know, who isn't in favor of legal access to medical cannabis? The people who voted against it, who put money against it were like the private prison industry, big pharma, um, the alcohol industry and the rehab industry. Those were like the industries against it. Most people are in favor to legal access to medical marijuana. Most people are in favor of legal access to recreational marijuana, like 69%. But to medical marijuana, like Republicans, Democrats, is really not very um, controversial. The only other people that seem to be against it are the medical societies, like the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association. They're still fighting the drug war, Nixon's drug war in the 1970s. It's uh, unclear what's gonna, um, it's gonna take to get them out of the middle ages. Um, Americans have like basically outvoted them and they're legalizing cannabis um, referendum by referendum, state by state, like in the medical societies, most of them oppose these referendums. Uh, in Mississippi, 74% of Mississippians, Mississippi is not a bastion of like hippie radicalism the last time I checked, 74% of Mississippians recently voted for to legalize medical marijuana and the American Medical Society signed on to this lawsuit against it, this ridiculous lawsuit that threw it out on a procedural technicality. Um, and again, most doctors support medical cannabis, it's just the medical societies. But the doctors um, don't know much about cannabis, they don't know how to prescribe it, and they don't know what to tell patients. So they usually just sort of ignore the issue altogether. And the patients are sort of afraid to bring it up to their doctors because the doctors are kind of dismissive about it. And so the patients don't really know where to get their information from. So they go to the bud tenders at the dispensaries, which is completely inappropriate because the bud tenders don't have any medical training. Then the doctors complain, how could you get your information from the bud tenders? See what happened when we legalized marijuana. But it's like, they're only getting their information from the bud tenders because the doctors don't know anything about it. Most people when they're polled say they wanna get their information from their doctors. So the question is, what is the problem? Problem number one is lack of education. Uh, the endocannabinoid system, this incredibly complex 
neurotransmitter system that explains how cannabis works and is going to be like uh, the key to all these phenomenal discoveries of drug development in the future is only taught at 13% of medical schools in this country, in other, in Europe and in Asia, it's taught because they're not still hung over or fighting the drug war. We have this hangover from the drug war that's like really limiting our education. It's really, really embarrassing. We also have this cultural bias against cannabis. You look at uh, the medical journals or groups like the American Society of Addiction Medicine, most of what they publish is anti-cannabis. You should publish the anti and the pro-cannabis so people can have a balanced opinion. We're not, we shouldn't still be fighting the drug war. At least doctors should be neutral on all this stuff. Um, doctors are very confused by the conflicting information. And I think I did a good job earlier of explaining why there's so much conflicting information. The pain society says there's no evidence it works for pain. There are all these other studies that say it does work for pain. The patients all say it works for pain. What's a doctor who doesn't even know what the endocannabinoid system is supposed to do? It's easier just to ignore the issue altogether and then complain that the patients are getting their information from the bud tenders. It also requires a paradigm shift. When I treat a patient for high blood pressure, I give them 10 milligrams of lisinopril and say, come back in a month, or I give them 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide. I take this once a day. With cannabis, it's like, here's a certification, take a few drops of this and take a few more every day, write down how you feel and see if you feel better. It's a complete paradigm shift for doctors. It's much more empowering for patients, but it involves a seeding of control from the doctor to the patient, which I think is wonderful, but a lot of doctors really aren't comfortable with it. And it does require um, relying more on real world evidence, i.e. listening to what the patient says and believing them. And that is just a, you know, it's a paradigm shift for doctors. I think younger doctors honestly have a lot easier time with this than older doctors. Um, it's still illegal on the federal level, uh, which makes doctors very uncomfortable, um, you know, but I think you have to do what's right for patients. That's a higher level of morality than just what's legal or illegal. I studied philosophy in college um, in Pennsylvania Swarthmore, and I already talked about types of data. So we need less stigma, better education of healthcare professionals, better education between doctors and patients is really dangerous. The patients don't feel comfortable bringing up their cannabis use uh, with their doctors. There are now like two systems of medical care and it's their medication interactions. If you're on medical cannabis, for example, you need more anesthesia, the, it, which isn't better or worse, but the anesthesiologist needs to know about it. And if the patient doesn't feel comfortable talking to the doctor, that's a disaster. So what I said in one of my pieces for Harvard Health is, if you're a doctor, whether you're pro, neutral, or against cannabis, you have to make the patient feel comfortable talking about it, or they're just going to clam up and you're going to create a really dangerous situation. And we need less politicization, politicization around cannabis. And then I'm just going to skip to the end. There's a strain named after my dad, uh, Lester Grinspoon, because uh, he'd be very, he's a very interesting person to look up on Wikipedia. So there's a cannabis strain named after him because he uh, did a huge thing to get um, cannabis legalized. And then I want to end with this Carl Sagan quote, um, the illegality of cannabis is an outrageous, is outrageous an impediment to full utilization of a drug which helps produce the serenity and insight, sensitivity and fellowship so desperately needed in this increasingly mad and dangerous world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Grinspoon. That was great. Um, certainly loved um, all of that research and we'll definitely um, have to get that PowerPoint for you and I'll be able to email that out to anyone who is interested. Um, so feel free anyone uh, to email me that. And if anyone does have a question for Dr. Grinspoon, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I'm gonna ask him a, a few that I have. Um, the first being um, with, I know that you've been kind of vocal about this on um, your Twitter feed, uh, talking about the or recent Oregon State study about um, uh, cannabis compounds blocking uh, COVID-19 uh, transmission into a molecule. Um, certainly would love to get your take on that since there was a lot of hype within the industry and then kind of what you think that the next steps are from this. 
Well, I thought it was a really interesting study and it was cool that they were able to show that the different cannabinoids um, did in fact prevent um, the SARS molecule from entering into cells. But um, I think people sort of misinterpreted it. And a lot of people in the cannabis community were very excited to interpret it. Um, hey, smoking cannabis uh, protects you against COVID. And that is a misinterpretation of what they actually found. Um, there are a lot of steps between what you find in the laboratory getting all the way to an effective medication. Uh, you have to duplicate or replicate your findings. You have to do animal studies to make sure that it works in animals. Then you have to do human studies and there's a whole sequence of human studies. There's like, um, you just the proof of concept and then phase one, phase two, phase three, and then you have to turn it into a medicine. And all along that sequence of events, it might not work. Um, in fact, there are tons of treatments that work on the molecular level that never turn out to work in humans. Um, for example, a close friend of mine is an Alzheimer's researcher, and he says that most treatments that work in animals never don't work in humans. Like there have been hundreds of medications that work in animals for Alzheimer's disease, and there hasn't been a single one really to work to reverse Alzheimer's disease in humans. Now this is going from animals to humans, hundreds to zero. We're talking about they showed something in a lab and it's not gonna get, it hasn't even been proven in animals, let alone in humans. So we're so far off from really showing anything that I just sort of felt like the reporters were being really irresponsible and getting people's hopes up. So again, it was interesting, but in terms of treatment, in terms of actually protecting against COVID, they didn't really show anything at all. And I thought the press did a terrible job of getting people's hopes up and sort of misleading people. Do you think that it's, um, certainly can't use it as a claim for, for a cure or anything like that, but as a call for reducing those federal restrictions on um, research and, and kind of expediting the process, um, do you think it's appropriate to be used in that type of manner? Absolutely. Um, well, the other ironic thing is what they used is the acidic form um, of the molecules. And, uh, you know, pe people who use cannabis know that THCA is the form, for example, in plants, and you have to, to have any effect, you have to smoke it or uh, decarboxylate it to make brownies and turn it, get rid of the A part. And so if you were to smoke cannabis, you'd um, change the molecules so they wouldn't be in the acidic form. So you'd destroy any of the molecules that they were using in the lab to block the SARS virus, the COVID virus, if you were to smoke cannabis. So there's that other component is like the minute you smoked it, you'd destroy all the molecules that they were using. But there shouldn't be these restrictions anyways um, on cannabis. And yes, uh, studies like this are yet again, another wonderful reminder that cannabis is right now in the category one under the Controlled Substance Act of high abuse liability, which is clearly not true, and no medical potential, which is even more clearly not true. I mean, there's a drug Epilidex made from CBD that the FDA has approved. So how could it have no medical utility if there's already a drug approved um, made from cannabis. So it's absolutely ridiculous. We need to rescue. And, and the sad part is that the United States is getting really far behind other countries like uh, Canada and Israel and countries in Europe where they don't have these arbitrary restrictions that are still sitting there from Richard Nixon's war on drugs 50 years ago that are preventing us from doing the research that we all want to do. Great. So the next question I want to ask is from uh, Gregory Connors. He asks, uh, as a medical sc student, uh, how do you recommend that uh, medical school students educate their, themselves on the endocannabinoid system, um, given that it isn't taught widely? Well, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, um, you should agitate to your medical schools. They should be teaching it. I mean, it's embarrassing. It's the endocannabinoid systems like the traffic control system for all the other uh, neurotransmitter systems. And it's a really incomplete medical education if you don't have a basic understanding of the endocannabinoid system. But second of all, there's a lot of great information out there. Um, our group, Doctors for Cannabis Regulation, dfcr.org, 
um, is a great group that uh, links doctors together for advocacy to try to get more doctors educated and organized around cannabis education. But also there, there's just a lot of great information out there. I'm happy um, if you wanna uh, reach me through my website, I'm happy to put you in touch with some sources, but there, there are um, an increasing number of very user-friendly sites um, for medical student and for physician education. People are filling in the gaps really quickly. So it's not that there aren't good educational materials, it's just that the medical schools haven't adopted them yet. So I can put you in touch with some very good materials. Great. And the next question, I'm going to just going to introduce um, Justin Serwinski. He's going to be leading up our um, Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Uh, Justin, if you want to pop on and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this was really informative, I think. Um, I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. I think my first one is pretty straightforward. But the first was, I was wondering if we see the same level of controversy or evidence denial even in um, the more anxiety focused uh, applications of medical cannabis or if it's more generated towards uh, the opioid kind of you know realm that you've touched on today? Well, it's interesting. Um, cannabis has an interesting relationship to anxiety. It's biphasic. In low doses, it tends to help with anxiety. And in high doses, it can make anxiety a lot worse. And some people can't even use it because even at low doses, they get, they get very anxious. Um, a lot of people get turned off from cannabis because they get overzealous and they get sort of upsold too by the bud tenders. And like, think of like an elderly patient and they go in to a dispensary and they're like, or to a recreational store and they're like, hey, that brownie looks delicious. And they'll take like a 50 milligram brownie and then they'll like freak out and they'll never go near it again. So that's where like uh, patient education really comes into, into play, making sure that everybody starts slow and, and goes slow and nobody um, sort of overdoses. I mean, you can't die from overdosing, but you certainly could have an awful uh, 12 hours. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting. The psychiatrists are so against using cannabis for any psychiatric indication. It, they make it really controversial. They say that cannabis is associated with higher rates of anxiety and depression. Therefore, cannabis is causing the higher rates of anxiety and depression. Whereas someone like me who's treated like hundreds of patients with cannabis for anxiety successfully, usually after they've seen their psychiatrist and the SSRI hasn't worked at all, would say, yeah, people with cannabis um, have higher rates of anxiety and depression because people who have anxiety and depression are self-treating with cannabis. So in the psychiatric realm, like in so many other realms with cannabis, we get into the chicken and the egg um, uh, problem. And that's one uh, area where uh, randomized controlled trials can actually help determine. With this real world evidence, you can get stuck with the chicken versus the egg problem. But um, it is very controversial. You know, the cynical part of me says they hate cannabis because they can't charge people $500 an hour for self-medicating with cannabis. A lot of people think that. Um, another part of me thinks they're just not familiar with it. They've been very involved with the war on drug, drugs. A lot of psychiatrists are very progressive about cannabis. You can't really generalize about them, but generally speaking, they've been, um, haven't been on board and, and anxiety and depression have been very controversial uses of cannabis. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and I guess on that note, um, so Jim did mention that I, I will kind of be coming into a potential leadership position, um, pre like presenting data and just discussion about uh, psychoactive drugs, um, you know, cannabis and um, psychedelics as well. But so I, I'm wondering how, when you encounter either an individual or a group, group of people that just you know, deny any evidence or don't even want to hear anything about data. Um, how do you either convince them or disarm them and, and kind of move through an interaction uh, when they just don't want to hear you know, anything that's positive? Well, a good example is like vaccines. Like I have patients in my inner city primary care clinic um, who just don't want to even discuss the vaccines. Right. And some people you can it helps if you have a relationship with them. Like if I've been their doctor for 15 years, I have a much better chance 
than if they're like a patient that I'm just covering and haven't met. So having a relationship really helps and having common ground really helps. It's like, well, you know, do you remember the time when I diagnosed your cancer and now you're alive and healthy? You know, well, have I, you know, led you wrong before? And they're like, no. I'm like, okay, well, give me five minutes to tell you about the vaccine. So having some kind of rapport really helps and trying to find common ground really helps. But some people uh, just, you can't get there. Um, it's so politicized and it's so polarized. You do your best to find common ground and to appeal to something that you guys both relate to and to connect with them on a human level and to put it in terms that you think that they can um, digest and they could um, relate to. And you know, if it's like something like drugs, is, would they relate to money? Are they fiscal conservatives? Why are we wasting all this money putting people in jail? Or are they interested in social justice? Or are they interested in science? I mean, usually you could find something in the drug issue because it's so broad that people connect to. But uh, if, they're, if it's a question of ideology and they're like, it's completely closed off, you just have to understand that there are times when you're just not gonna connect to people. You're not gonna have 100% batting average, <laughs> a thousand percent right. adding average. So um, you just ha also have to understand that it's not your fault if someone's like completely closed off. I have a few people uh, that come in with vaccines and they've just watched so much, uh, you know, far right television that they're like, so they're really secretive about why they won't even talk to me about the, they're secretive about why they don't even want to talk about the vaccine. And that's how bad it is. I'm like, no, we don't talk about that. And that's the end of the discussion. And of course, I'm not going to get anywhere with someone like that. So you do your best and try to find common ground. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. And I'll, I'll try to employ that uh, to some degree <clears throat> uh, moving forward. Yeah. Thanks. Those are my two questions. I appreciate it. So the last question that we have in the chat is from uh, Dr. Kumar Bhagava. Um, he would like you to say something kind of about uh, the literature ratio between THC and CBD for different diseases. Uh, I found that uh, a one to two ratio works well for Parkinson's, um, but there is no other evidence except um, that someone played around with it and came up with the ratio. Um, kind of going off of your earlier point about um, talking with bud tenders, not really kind of having that uh, medical background training, um, kind of speaking to potentially Parkinson's or any other diseases that, that you know that those ratios really work well with? Well, it depends what, what disease you're treating. There are so many different diseases. I mean, um, in some ways they have comp CBD and THC have uh, synergistic effects. And in some ways they have complementary effects. And in some ways um, they, it depends on the dosage. Um, like um, in the Dr. Gruber study that I recommend mentioned for um, pain, she found that THC was helping with the pain and the CBD was helping with the anxiety. Um, whereas for insomnia, um, low doses of THC make you sleepy, whereas higher doses of THC can make you awake. Uh, um, whereas CBD is the opposite, like low doses of CBD can be stimulating and high doses of CBD uh, can make you sleepy. So it really depends on like what disease you're treating and what the dosages are. Um, you know, CBD has so many different indications. CBD is most commonly used for chronic pain, insomnia, and um, anxiety, but it's also, um, you know, FDA approved for um, childhood epilepsy. And I think it has very interesting potential for addiction. Um, and, you know, THC, i.e. medical marijuana, has like dozens of, of indications. And in terms of the ratio, um, a lot of it's trial and error. Um, I think that um, one of the really good things about CBD is that it's shown, it's believed to help mitigate some of the adverse side effects of THC. One of the side effects of THC that is pretty commonly agreed upon and notice I said agreed upon with cannabis, which is a rare thing, is that it can cause short-term memory loss. Uh, it's reversible. Like if you stop using cannabis for three weeks, your memory is totally fine. But when you use cannabis, you smoke a joint, you definitely have somewhat short-term memory loss. You can't remember things. It does other things to your brain, which people think are good, like increases your creativity and so forth, but it definitely can cause short-term memory. CBD is thought to mitigate a lot of the harms of acute cannabis use, like short-term memory loss. It's thought to protect your memory. 
So I think CBD should almost always be used with THC, both medically and recreationally. Um, in terms of ratios, I just don't think that's been studied. Uh, what is the optimal dose of CBD to use to protect your brain against the negative effects of THC? Obviously, I'm a medical cannabis doctor. I don't think THC is that toxic or I wouldn't recommend it to a lot of patients, but I do think CBD protects. But I don't know the right ratio. That's it a great question because that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to study. And that's exactly why cannabis can't be schedule one under the Controlled Substance Act. It makes it almost impossible to study. We're not studying that here very efficiently. The cannabis researchers have to go through so much paperwork and so much misery just to get each study done. Um, you know, they, they treat cannabis like plutonium in this country. At the same time, uh, people can go right to a dispensary or in Massachusetts where it's legal, you can walk right outside and go to a store and get this great cannabis. Whereas the researchers have to go through so much just to study it because it's with federal dollars and the federal government said it has, says it has no medical utility and high abuse liability. So we've got to get this stranglehold off the backs of the researchers that's being put on by the federal government. So I don't have a good answer to the ratios of CBD to THC. When I recommend it for people, commonly people will come in for pain or for anxiety. I'll say, why don't you get a four to one or 12 to one CBD to THC tincture. Use that under your tongue in the early evening. That ensures they get plenty of CBD. They work their way up slowly. They're not going to get too high a dose of THC because they're going to start with two or three milligrams and go up slowly. There's no way to freak out if you're starting at two or three milligrams. I start very conservatively with plenty of CBD to protect them and make sure that they're just starting low and going slow. So I approach it very conservatively. I'm a huge fan of CBD, but I don't have a great answer to that because it hasn't been studied. Great. I think we have time for one last question here um, from Gregory Connors. Uh, can you address some of the potential harms of long-term medical cannabis use or even recreational use um, for chronic pain and diseases? Um, for example, um, potentially even the cannabinoid uh, hypermesis syndrome um, and how to approach those issues? Sure. Well, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome isn't like a long-term harm as much as like an acute toxic effect. I've seen it, it's horrible. Um, what it is is cannabis is very good for treating nausea um, because it works on a receptor, the TRPV1 receptor. But if heavy cannabis users uh, chronically stimulate it, you could have a paradoxical reaction. A paradoxical reaction is when a drug does the opposite. You know, Benadryl makes most people sleepy, but in like 1% of people, Benadryl will make someone hyper. They have a paradoxical reaction. So with cannabis, with most people, it helps with nausea, but in very heavy users, it could make you vomit uncontrollably for like 24, 48 hours. And it's very difficult to treat. It's called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So that's not really, I guess that can be from chronic use, but chronic heavy use. The only way to tell if you have cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is to stop smoking cannabis for three months. And then if it goes away, it's cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. If it doesn't go away, then it's something very similar that you can't distinguish called cyclic vomiting syndrome. The only difference is one is caused by cannabis and one is caused without cannabis. And the only way to tell is to remove the cannabis. If someone can't stop smoking cannabis for three months, then I think they're addicted to cannabis. I've had a couple of patients that can't stop and they end up in the emergency room every like twice a month. And you know, the definition of addiction to me is continued use despite um, negative outcomes. And that's pretty bad if you're in the ER overnight, like once or twice a, you know, a month. Um, so that's um, cyclic vomiting syndrome. Um, I'm sorry, that's cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. But the long-term uses of cannabis, um, it depends, if you're using, it's much safer if it's legal, like all drugs actually. If you're getting it from a dispensary and it doesn't have lead, pesticides, mold, heavy metal, you know what you're getting. It's much safer than if you're getting weed off the streets that has God knows what contaminants in them. 
So it's much safer if you're getting it legally. It's never good to smoke anything. We don't recommend that at all. Uh, cannabis has never been associated with lung cancer, but at the same time, smoking is just not good for your lungs. It can cause irritation, chronic bronchitis. It's much safer to get one of those dry herb vaporizers and to vaporize brown flour. You only have to heat it up to 400 degrees to get the cannabinoids out. Uh, when you smoke it, you heat it up to 1100 degrees. You just incinerate it. You get the tar, the benzenes, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So I don't think it's very good for your lungs to smoke it long-term, but if you vaporize it or use a tincture or an edible, it's a lot safer. Um, you know, if you don't drive, you don't use it when you're pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, you don't use it as an adolescent. Um, and you um, use it with CBD to protect your memory. Um, I don't think as an adult uh, that uses it um, responsibly and modestly, there's a lot of evidence that there are a lot of long-term consequences. Uh, Nora Volkow, the head of um, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, who's been very anti-cannabis, but recently has been moderating her views, pretty recently said that she doesn't know of much evidence that like, adult moderate cannabis users who use it responsibly, that there is a lot of evidence that there's uh, long-term harm involved. It's much safer than cigarettes, much safer than alcohol. I think if people were to, the, a recent study came out that said there's no safe level of alcohol for adults. If people were to shift their moderate alcohol drinking to moderate cannabis uh, consumption uh, under the caveats that I just explained, I think they'd be a lot healthier. Great. So I think since we started a little bit late, um, would you be okay with one last question, Dr. Grinspoon? Absolutely. Great. Okay. So um, Abigail kind of going off of this topic of smoking versus edibles um, had asked, um, um, is there any difference in terms of long-term effects that you know of in terms of with edibles or with smoking? And Abigail, feel free to drop me a message if that wasn't exactly what you meant. Um, well, edibles are better for your lungs. Um, you know, you don't want to eat like super sugary fattening edibles in this day and age where there's an epidemic of obesity and diabetes. Um, if you can get the dosing right in edibles, I think they're a perfectly reasonable and safe uh, way to take cannabis. The problem with edibles is they don't kick in for an hour, an hour and a half. A lot of people make the classic mistake of you take an edible nothing happens, uh, what's wrong with this stuff? You eat like four more and then you end up like way too high. And the other problem is edibles last um, for, you know, eight to 12 hours. And, you know, if something comes up and you have to drive, that's a very dangerous situation. Whereas if you inhale it, it only lasts for two to three hours. So, but as long as like, you don't have to do anything that requires uh, operating a heavy machinery or, you um, driving and as long as you get the dosing right, you know, you take a modest dose, the same dose every day. Uh, I think edibles are a perfectly safe way to consume cannabis. The other thing is that um, you do metabolize it a little bit differently. When you smoke, you get Delta 9 THC. And when you take an edible, you get Delta 11 THC because it goes through your digestive tract and through your liver. Delta 11 THC people find to be a little bit stronger but um, you know, people get used to it. They don't mind that. Uh, edibles are perfectly fine. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Grinspoon, for your time. I'll certainly be sure to follow up with you after this. Um, definitely gonna get the PowerPoint and forward that along to, to a few of our students here. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, as always, if you have any questions for me uh, or for Dr. Grinspoon, feel free to shoot them to my email. It's js4982 at drexel.edu. I certainly send you all out the invitation for this event. Feel free to respond. Um, and thanks again, Dr. Grinspoon. Okay, thanks you guys. Great questions. Have a good night.